button and we can get started. Yep, got it. We're good. Whenever you're ready. You're ready to go? Okay. All right. Ready, set, go. Well, welcome everybody to our webinar today. My name is Lisa Lisney. I'm a senior marketing manager with Corwin, and we sure appreciate you joining us today for Beyond Food, Fun, and Festivals, Global Education Tools for Authentic Learning, um, presented today by Homa Tavinger and Becky Morales. Um, Homa is the author of Growing Up Global, Raising Children to Be at Home in the World, which is a publication that was hailed by national education and business leaders and media, ranging from Dr. Jane Goodall to the BBC, NBC, ABC, WashingtonPost.com, the Chicago Tribune and Sun-Times, PBS, Scholastic, Parents Magazine, and many others. Her work is sparking initiatives to help audiences from CEOs to kindergartners learn and thrive in a global context. Homa has been a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania and is a contributor to the Huffington Post, PBS, Sprout TV, Moms Rising, Good, Ashoka's Start Empathy Initiative, and Edutopia, among other media. And she's very much a sought-after speaker and trainer around global citizenship, parenting, globalizing curriculum, empathy, and inclusion. Becky Morales is the founder of Kid World Citizen. Um, you can see the, the website address there up on the screen. Um, which is a website that offers parents and educators activities that help young minds build global. Becky's work has been featured on Scholastic, the U.S. Department of Education, NBC Latino, MSN, and PBS Kids, among others. She's a teacher, a teacher trainer, a speaker, and an educational consultant. She's worked with different foreign exchange programs, including the setup mm -hmm. of the International Club at her local elementary school. And with that, I will turn it over to Homer and Becky. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome to everyone who is listening live and uh, maybe listening in the future. Um, we're very excited. This is uh, Becky and my first time doing um, a webinar in this sort of format together um, with this new book we're really excited about. And um, as you can see on the first slide, um, Global Education Toolkit for Elementary Learners is our joint project. and so. We're going to be touching on a lot of um, ideas and initiatives that come out of the book. Um, and we hope to spark new ideas and hopefully um, get great new feedback as well. So um, I'm going to ask Becky to advance the slide. She's going to be controlling this from Houston. I'm in Philadelphia. Corwin is in Los Angeles. So. This is exciting. <laughs> we're all over the place. Um, so I want to give a little overview where we're coming from. Um, basically, in the book, in the Global Ed Toolkit, we have two distinct strands. There is first a curricular or a classroom-based strand, and we spend a lot of time on how to incorporate um, global concepts and perspectives into all subject areas. We'll go into that in more detail. But we also acknowledge that even though we are trying to get beyond food, fun, and festivals, for many schools, special events will be the entree to um, gaining some foothold in global experiences and global education. So we don't want to discount the value of special events, and we hope that through the tools in the book, we help make special events more meaningful, more doable, more inclusive, to have more people engaged in them. Um, so we want to acknowledge that these are both valuable, and um, it's just sort of a matter of how you go about doing it. OK, next slide. Um, so some of the guiding principles, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And um, I know that we still are waiting for people to join, but we, we have a poll um, that we're going to put up on the screen to simultaneously, you can answer a question in the poll. Um, have you tried to incorporate global content into your teaching? And you've got, um, it's about a minute to answer that, I believe. And then our core, wonderful people at Corwin are going to tabulate that and share um, what sort of global education uh, you may have tried. Um, so. While you're filling that out, I want to talk a little bit about some of the guiding principles. Um, first, to start with what you love. 
uh, we really believe in an idea of passion-driven learning. So you don't have to be forced to do something that doesn't feel natural to you or doesn't feel like what you love. And so I sort of challenge any listener, any participant, um, find something you love, and I bet you can find a way to sort of include a global twist into that. Um, next, avoid silos, um, both as far as siloing people. So um, you don't want to be, oh, that's the person who likes global, or that's the global education class or bulletin board or whatever it might be, um, find champions, envision more broadly what that might look like, and see if you can integrate it more naturally and organically into the life of your school. Next, embrace technology. Um, we are not against technology at all, but we also don't believe that it should drive um, that the apps and the tools should drive the experience. We really see technology as a tool for meaningful connection, not an end in itself. Um, next, that we see global education as a platform for universal values like inclusion, empathy, curiosity, kindness, respect, resilience, and service. Um, in other words, lessons about places and things stick when they're about much more than an exotic place or culture. Um, the lessons can show the values that are important to you as opposed to just talking about them. And we have found over and over that global education is a wonderful platform to impart really what it means to be human. And finally, mind your own community. Um, it's so wonderful that this time that we live in um, includes in many, many communities, people from all over the world with many experiences or people who've lived in different parts of the world or who have a passion for different cultures, different ways of doing things. And each of them can serve as a wonderful resource for each of our communities. So next. Next slide. Um, and before, how about um, before I go into the next slide? So we have some responses, and it looks like um, the most um, incorporating global has been in reading, writing, and language arts, social studies, which is what we expect, um, art and music a bit, and um, I. It's interesting. No math, science, physical education yet. Um, but we're going to talk about those a little bit, so hopefully that's going to be a helpful, um, some helpful resources that we'll bring to the table. Um, this next slide I'm just going to touch on really quick. Um, many schools find it helpful to pick a theme for a global week or a global activity. And in the book, we have dozens of themes that we've outlined that fall into these categories of different holidays and celebrations. For example, you could pick um, different holidays that fall in the spring in different cultures, or themes around travel and geography. Maybe it has to do with landmarks. Maybe it has to do with where in the world would you like to go. Um, then there's lots around science and natural resources, and of course, arts and culture. So this is a way just to get really creative on rallying and unifying your school community um, around a theme. Okay, next. So my name is Becky. This is Becky now talking. Um, in our book, we have a really great feature that has 50, actually more than 50, different ideas of um, ways that you can incorporate global events into your curriculum. And so what we're going to look at now are some examples that are in the book. Um, one way that a lot of schools do incorporate some global lessons throughout their whole school is to use school-wide crafts, displays, or bulletin boards. Um, this is from my school. We did a multicultural paper doll project in third grade, and they had to research a culture, research their clothes. They talked about um, <clears throat> the different reasons for wearing certain materials, different patterns, what it was like for different holidays. And in the book, we give some more examples of school-wide crafts. 
We also talk about incorporating food. Um, of course, some schools you're not allowed to bring in homemade food, so we talk about that. Um, but you are allowed to bring in store-bought. For example, we do an International Bread Day. That is just fantastic. Kids walk away saying it's their favorite day of the whole school year. Everyone brings in a bread from a different culture, and they get to share it with their classmates. It's kind of like carb loading, <laughs> but it was a global twist. And, you know, kids always get excited about food. So that's a fun way. Um, music, movement, sports, and play. It's great when you think about bringing programs into the school, but instead of bringing in, you know, a magician or you're talking to an athlete, it's fun if you bring in some of your community groups around town that have a cultural twist. So we have these um, Chinese acrobats come into our school, and they give a little history of why acrobatting was important in China and where it came from, and then they perform for the kids. And you can see that they were completely captivated. They wouldn't look away from all the tricks that they were doing. And even in sports, when we talk about PE, someone might say, you know, how can I – do global activities in PE. There's actually a lot of resources out there to pull playground games from around the world or sports or talking about the World Cup or um, trying a new game that they've never done before. There was a school in Switzerland that had a website where you could submit a video of your kids playing a typical game from your country like tag or um, kickball, and then they got to watch the videos of all the different kids from different countries and what they played, and they tried to teach them the rules. Um, a lot of schools, their first step in globalizing is to have an international day, an international night, or even an international week or an international month, and there's a lot of activities that you can do within that first kind of your first step into the global waters, um, we had a little parade. So we had kids dress up in their ethnic dress, and it could be, you know, as simple as a soccer jersey from Brazil or Germany or as elegant as, you know, a chi pao from China or something, and all the kids walked around and we had an international parade. Sometimes it's hard to get schools to take that first step, um, and they don't know really about global education, what it's going to mean, and so we give you a lot of ideas that are kind of baby steps towards a larger goal of incorporating global lessons across the curriculum. Um, one simple way, even with the youngest kids, even in pre-K, is to devise a lesson of using the five senses to explore a country. And this works really well with kindergarten first, but it also works well with the older kids. So. Um, you can have parents come in, and instead of just inviting them in to say, can you please come talk about your culture, it's nice to give them uh, a format. So you say, you know, choose one thing from each of the senses. So something that they can smell that represents your country, and you can talk about it, something you can taste, something you can feel, and go through the five senses, and that's a, w a very tangible way that kids can explore a country or expand their empathy. Um, another topic that we go into um, in a pretty great amount of detail is the idea of um, using movies from around the world. And we really think this is an ideal window to gaining a wider perspective, to building compassion, and it's a great tool for media literacy. So in the book we have a whole discussion guide around um, how to use those movies, what are some great discussion prompts for deeper learning, and that's a great way to reach um, different abilities kids as well. Okay, next. Um, and, of course, um, the effort to integrate a global perspective into the school environment throughout the year is um, kind of an, an overall goal. Uh, so next slide shows one project that helps to do that. Um, and we feature the Out of Eden Walk um, and feature a lesson plan in the Global Education Toolkit around um, Paul Salopek, who is a National Geographic Fellow and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, who is walking the planet for seven years. And there are some wonderful education partners um, who have developed curriculum and are developing all kinds of community and classroom activity to virtually participate on, in the walk. Um, starting from your classroom, it can be things as simple as paying attention to 
um, what a walk around your school or home may be like, and writing that down, using that as a writing prompt. So that's an example of sort of a year-long or year-round um, global perspective-taking curriculum that we feature in the book. Next. Um, and I think that, um, so Becky is going to talk about um, various academic subject areas in which you can infuse global learning. Next. So we get a lot of questions of um, teachers want to know how they can integrate these global lessons into just their day-to-day -day curriculum. Um, because it seems very obvious that you can do it in social studies. It lends itself to learning about other cultures. Oftentimes, it's already included in the textbook. But how can we get it um, throughout the curriculum into the different disciplines? So we first, we took a look at the common themes that are seen in virtually all elementary schools. Um, we have farms, five senses, animals, rainforest, pollution. And we talk about, if you look at these themes, how could you pull global lessons into each of these themes? So for example, when you're talking about the water cycle, we include a lesson that stems from, um, it talks about raining in Peru and how the snow melts from the mountains and it flows into the Amazon and it includes a map and it shows the kid what happens when, if there's a drought in the Andes, how it affects the Amazon River, vice versa. If there's a, a huge rainstorm, how does it affect the, ra the rainforest and the river? And we talk about how we can use these common lessons that you're already going to be teaching. You already have to include this in your curriculum. But how you can take a global lesson and pop it in there without disrupting your regular curriculum. And so one example, we have a very large chart in the book, but we just took two cells out of the chart. If you're talking about families and communities, everyone does that unit in kindergarten or first grade, or, um, second. What differences and similarities do you find in families and communities, not only within our state or within our town, but looking at across the world? What um, jobs do kids need to do in our, in our homes, and what chores do they have in Cambodia? Or what, um, how many kids and, and who lives in the home here versus who lives in the home and how many kids and what extended family lives with you in Pakistan. So it's nice to find the differences and similarities using a common unit that you're already going to be teaching in class. Um, and then we talked about the water slide, the water cycle on the last slide. We also, in the book, we have a list of fabulous literature, children's literature, nonfiction and fiction, that can help you to incorporate these global lessons into your curriculum. Um, these books that we have up here, What's for Lunch and The Wonderful Houses Around the World, and then the one that um, Off the Class describes some different schools around the world, these are a great starting point if you're talking about families and communities, pulling out these books and saying, well, let's look at it. How, why do they only have one large bedroom where lots of different people can sleep, and let's look at what the difference is, but the similarities too. We each have a kitchen. We each gather around uh, a meeting place to eat every night. And so we give you this list so that it's easier for you to find resources to help globalize those lessons. Um, we also give a list of video links that are online. You don't necessarily, if, you, if your library doesn't hold these books, you are able to access this using the internet. For example, Families of the World is a series on YouTube that includes an urban family and a rural family from, I think, 20 or 30 different countries. And they're great short clips. These are each just a couple minutes long. And you can talk about the differences between the urban family, the rural family, and then your family, where, wherever your students come from. Because, of course, we don't want our students to only get a single story and think that everyone in Vietnam, you know, lives in a rural farm. There are people, and there's also people that live in urban cities. And so it's nice to show the kids um, in a video these differences. And that was, those could be incorporated really in social studies or in language arts, but a lot of schools right now are, are following the common core. And one of the questions we've gotten is how do we incorporate the global education into common core standards? So we have a chart in the book, it's several pages long, where we list the common core standards. This one is about speaking and listening and collaborative conversations. This is from kinder through fifth. And we discuss how you can follow the common core but still 
be instilling global education lessons. So, for example, for collaborative conversations, if you look back at the slide, it's talking about rules for discussion, taking turns, having multiple exchanges. Some of the examples we give are Skyping in the classroom or having a Twitter account for your class, um, participating in some of the chats with other classrooms. Um, the Global Read Aloud is, is a project that we'll talk about in a minute. One thing that we did in our classroom was ESL partners. So within our school, we had kids that were already proficient English language speakers speaking with students that were still English language learners and were having them collaborate on a project together. So they were able to start seeing things from different perspectives. Um, the Skype lesson, we go into a great deal of how to set up a Skype lesson and what questions you can ask, some ideas for themes. The kids really like Skyping with another class. That, that might be one of their favorite things that we've done. Um, we were Skyping, this, in this example, we're Skyping with a class from Canada who even brought in a snowball to show us over the screen. And our kids were just flipping out because we're from Texas and they haven't seen snow yet. They showed us how they put on their snow pants. And they showed us, they were showing us a dance and we were showing them a dance. And it was, it was really fun for the kids to do that. Um, the Global Read Aloud, this is a virtual book club that you do online during a set six week period. And so when you go to the Global Read Aloud website, it tells you how to sign up and you can make as many connections as possible and you get to decide how you're going to be communicating with the classes that you've connected with. So you can use Edmodo, you can use the Twitter hashtag, you can, follow the wiki, do regular mail, set up a kid blog. Um, in 2012, they did the book, The One and Only Ivan, which is a very popular, actually award-winning book. And these were some of the examples. They had this great bulletin board where kids got to do, use post-it notes, virtual post-it notes, to give comments about the book. And what's fun is that they're reading the comments from kids in Indonesia that are reading the same book at the same time. Um, this class in Argentina made a, a video so that they could share, hold on one second. They made videos of their impressions of the book, or they made these little word art, word clouds. And so it's neat all the different activities that you can do. Um, one Swiss class asked on their blog, what do you think is going to happen next? And when you write your prediction, include the page number. And they had so many comments. Here's a comment from Switzerland, from Canada, from the United States. And the kids were engaging in this conversation for six weeks. It wasn't just a one-time hit. They were still doing their English language arts. You know, they still were reading the books that they needed to read, but they got to have conversations with kids around the world. Um, in 2014, these were the Global Read Aloud elementary books. They picked out several, and you got to choose which one um, you, your class was going to participate in. And this is the website. At the very bottom of the slide, you can see the website and sign up. They're still voting for the next year's book, 2015. Um, another language arts was to explore digital tools to produce and publish writing. Um, Kid Blog is a great example, but also Twitter. And there's a lot of online already set up projects. If you don't want to set up your own blog because it might be too intimidating, that's kind of a big first step. There are many projects that are already set up. One of them, the Koala Bears, um, a class set up a blog and said, take a picture out of your classroom window and post it here and tell us where you're from. And so this was honestly a picture that an Australian um, class posted. The teddy bear next to the Japanese sign, there's a lot of projects going on that we list in the book that sends a stuffed animal to a different country and then writes stories about it. And so you can sign up. We explain how you can sign up for the different projects. Um, there's a lot of Twitter projects going on, too. The hashtag KinderChat is extremely popular, and a lot of people participate. And last year and the year before, I think for a couple years, they've done a project in September of school lunch pick, hashtag school lunch pick, and they'll just have students and teachers really tweet pictures of their kids' lunches that day. And so you can show your class, look what kids in Alabama are eating for lunch, and look what kids in South Africa are eating for lunch. Um, math, sometimes people think, is a little bit harder. Did you want to talk about this, Homa? Um, sure, sure. I think um, one of the exciting things is that um, we've seen over and over that there are wonderful ways to incorporate the world in math problems. 
Um, you can go to the next slide and we can show some of those pictures. Um, so, for example, real distances that teach real geography, real sort of, um, you know, the relative distances, the actual, you know, what's happening in the world, learning about different currencies, even um, statistics with various sports, converting measurements. Um, and all of this is what Common Core Math is striving for us to do. So. The global education, the global sort of angle to this is a wonderful, natural way to get really excited, if that's possible, about the Common Core Standards and math. It makes it really, just makes it real. Okay, next. Um, so word problems, um, not only um, incorporating potentially new names, languages, um, but different realities, whether it has to do with time zones, um, actual, you know, this is a, an example of a math lesson with um, skyscrapers around the world. So you get to know architecture, you get to know, um, you know, the relative size, the location of it. Um, but also, as the next slide, Becky, um, shows, I'm really excited about, well, this this is, learning um, the Common Core lesson on place value and decimal can really be like the next slide. The UNICEF World Food Program um, slide shows that math can really serve as a wonderful empathy builder. Um, so when you know actual amounts and actual percentages of one's income that goes to paying for essentials, and how much is going to be left, or what it what people are really earning, and what it costs to live um, in different countries or different cities. That's not just a math lesson; that's an empathy lesson, and that is we have found over and over a really strong way to engage students in deeper learning because it's real. And so here are some examples of word problems um, that went with that World Food Program curriculum, and so we share all these links um, to going deeper on those, um, the curricula that can really build empathy as well as math skills, deeper math skills. Next. Uh, and Becky, I think you're going to talk about the science lesson. Mm -hmm. So the science lesson, I noticed in the poll there wasn't anyone that had yet included global learning into science, but anything related to the environment, it it's almost a no-brainer to include global lessons because we're more and more connected and more what happens, what we're doing with our trash is affecting everyone in the world, what the pollution, everything is really interconnected, and that's the message that we want to give to our students. So when we're talking about recycling and the effects of trash on our oceans, it makes sense to talk about what's happening in the rest of the world as well. Um, with the food, with the water cycle and conservation, we give a lot of different links with the water cycle. That's such a common theme in elementary, and there are a lot of online projects and um, collaborative projects and just information and resources to teach about how that affects the world. Um, with food and nutrition, whether they're learning it in PE or health, you can also learn about global hunger, animal habitats, and climate change. There's a lot of pairing of lessons that, that go together really nicely. Um, music and art, there are so many multicultural art projects and obviously global music that we can be exposing to our kids. Um, for example, one of our favorites is the Google, the Google Art Project where you can go online and get a virtual tour of, I want to say, hundreds of different museums around the world. So when you're studying um, gold, you can go online and see the Columbian Gold Museum and get a virtual tour. You can, you can be walking through the hallways and seeing the different art projects. Um, world languages, feel free to send in the chat box if you have a world language component. Obviously, world language is one of the key components of global education, but not a lot of schools, not all schools have a world language program. So we give ideas for how you can incorporate learning about world languages, even if you do not have a teacher that speaks it, and even if you do not have a curriculum, a set time during the day when you have that subject. There are still ways to incorporate some world languages into your school day. <clears throat> and also just to be, um, we also have tools for 
if you do have a world language component mm -hmm. in your elementary school, how can you make that successful based on um, case studies and models of school districts that have been very dedicated to that topic? Mm, exactly. Um, the technology tools, we're going to put up another poll right now. You'll see it popping up. Which tools are used in your school, in your classroom? What are your favorites? How have you used technology to connect with a classroom in another city or another country? We'll keep this up for a couple minutes. Um, obviously, there are many different ways that you can use technology. And sometimes it's intimidating to take the first step. We've given, we've broken it down and explained not only how to sign up, but how to use Twitter. People say, you know, use Twitter in the classroom, but how exactly can we use Twitter, whether it's following a hashtag of a current event that's related to what you're learning about, or maybe following someone like Jane Goodall, or maybe another organization that is um, supporting what you've been talking about in science class, for example. Um, setting up a Facebook account just for parents so that you can reach parents that maybe they're working and they haven't. Um, there's many different ways of reaching parents and pulling them in so that they can help volunteer and offer their cultural insights. Edmodo is becoming more popular. Um, Skype in the Classroom we talked about. There's many different wikis, and we list several of the excellent ones in our book. Um, Google Hangouts. It doesn't have to always be Skype in the classroom. There's other video conferencing tools that you can use. Um, FaceTime is another one. And we talk a little bit about blogging. Some of the things that you need to be careful for and also what you can teach, what lessons go along with blogging. Not just teaching the kids how to read and write, but how are they connecting with, the, with their audience? How are they using digital citizenship by leaving kind comments? And how they are not revealing personal information um, online, but also how they can learn from kids in another part of the world using all of these different technology um, tools. And so I'm curious if anyone has used technology um, in the poll, please answer which one that you've used. And um, we will see the results in a couple minutes while we're going through this. OK. Um, so this, this is sort of, we're going sort of chapter by chapter in the book, and we're giving a big, quick overview. So the last chapter in the book has to do with charitable giving and service, um, making a difference. And the idea that um, I, I really see, we see global citizenship as sort of um, equivalent to being a friend to the whole human race. And if you're a friend on a wider level, you really want to help your friend out. So naturally, um, next slide please, you're going to want to make a difference. And so some of the planning tools that can help a school get started. First, decide what type of charitable project best fits your objectives, values, preferences, and resource capacity. So I'm going to give some examples of the types of projects you might do that can help. Use a variety of tools to help research which organizations fit your goals. Um, are they transparent? Is the management suiting your style? Are they local? Can you talk to people? Do they have a website that you like that you can relate to? Um, and then integrate learning into the service. So there might be lessons in writing or math or science that go with the uh, charitable giving and service. And finally, build in reflection and celebration. Um, a lot of times there will be a big project, but um, no time for reflection and processing what did we learn out of this. So one example in the book is um, a classroom from Canada, um, a really enthusiastic teacher who started this global grade threes and pennies for Peru. And she wrote back to us that it was one of the most powerful and engaging learning experiences I have been lucky enough to be part of in 25 years of teaching. And it changed her and it changed the kids. Um, next slide. So there were, out of this Pennies for Peru, um, there were a lot of lessons that came out of that. They started with a one-time video call to Peru. And the academic lesson that came out of that was they um, 
were studying cultures in South America, and all of a sudden that culture became more real, more alive. Then as they started to develop a relationship with the community in Peru where they had a connection, um, they learned that the quote-unquote help that the kids had chosen in Canada that they wanted to get started wasn't really what the village um, wanted. It wasn't what the people that they had been in touch with wanted. And for these third graders, um, it really sort of became a lesson in economics, in sustainability, and in a little bit of paternalism even. Um, they So to kind of make their giving more impactful, they decided they can't go it alone, and they found, um, a, we call them a high-integrity nonprofit organization that they partnered with. And um, through that, it not only um, was a really important life lesson and a management lesson, but they also took away a lot of academic lessons through this, like um, learning, reinforcing their math facts through their um, a, a web counter on their blog, and again, counting money that was coming in, counting what they were donating, counting a lot of different um, it, it, there were a lot of different math examples from their engagement and their fundraising. Um, another lesson, they did reach ambitious but tangible goals as well as acknowledging failures at the same time. And through the blog that they started, they learned some important Internet safety lessons that had to do with comments on the blog, that had to do with the web counter, that had to do with their time that they spent online. And um, the teacher's dedication definitely came out in this process, um, as well as the academic side, writing for a public audience. So as they blogged about the progress in this Pennies for Peru um, and the Global Grade Threes, they started a blog, and the quality of their writing really improved. Um, because they were writing for a more public audience. And sometimes it started with aunts and uncles and parents commenting on the blog, and it really grew to a wider audience. Okay, next. Um, and these are some of the pictures that the class sent us. Um, first, um, on the top left, that's the final library. It turned out that what the community really wanted more than the soccer field that the Canadian kids thought they would want was a decent library and a place where they could have books and store books and study peacefully, get their work done. Um, the picture on the top um, right is one of the Skype discussions they had with a community volunteer in that uh, village in the mountains in Peru. And then the bottom picture, as you see, the, those are some of the math lessons with money. Um, they also, by the way, learned the value of how much farther their Canadian dollars went when converting them into Peruvian currency. And then um, writing on their blog is, is the bottom picture. Okay, next. Next, please. Okay, another example is um, Rachel's Walk for Water. Um, this was an initiative of one girl who um, it's become more and more popular to do a walk for water, combining the tangible effort of a walk with um, the need to provide clean water. And they had a goal of building wells in India, but it also was a great sort of fitness um, initiative at the school. And um, it was a, I think it was a real big inclusion builder and a big unifier at the school as well. So we sort of walked through some of the steps. But a lot of this can simply be done brainstorming um, for um, among, oh, I forgot to ask if you've tried a service learning activity with your school. Um, so that's the, the next um, polls that we have out. We find these service learning activities are just phenomenal ways to reinforce the lessons. And there may be good literature that goes along with it, good media literacy. 
Um, another one that we followed closely has been um, an initiative of an 11-year-old girl um, that the World Food Program followed. She lives in a slum, the Kibera, the large Kibera slum in Kenya. And Molly's World, they gave um, this 11-year-old girl a flip cam, and she documents her life. And then we have these discussion questions that can help students relate better to Molly, and they really do. The way that it's presented on the website allows students to sort of get inside her life in Kibera, and then um, naturally flows is the desire to do something about hunger in the world, and that can also be um, an initiative that is close by or far away. Um, okay, next, um, Pinterest is a wonderful way to keep track of initiatives and learn about um, what kids are doing around the world, um, social media as well. Next. And uh, we find that if you focus on tangible projects, um, so these are some, we've got Kidnits is a great website. Um, that is Knitting Hats for Kids in Need, sourcing from Rwanda and Chile for the material, um, flag pins that kids made for Haiti to help um, earthquake victims, donating bikes, this uh, boy who slept in a box to gain empathy for people that were homeless and then ended up fundraising, free rice is a very popular game that kids can play, um, and then the Empty Bowl Initiative is also really fun, um, combining ceramic arts, um, a night of sharing a meal of soup or salad, and then donating the proceeds for hunger in the local community. So these are all really great um, initiatives that we've seen um, people do and we showcase in the book. Lots and lots of examples. Okay, next. So we have these 12 takeaways um, that we sort of lessons that over and over, here's the first six um, that come up over and over with all the organizations. Partnering with an organization, start with what you love, becoming a humble listener, letting information sink in um, because a lot of times this stuff is heavy. And so when kids learn about these serious needs, um, it does take some time to process the information. Um, setting manageable fundraising goals that become more important than just the, a big dollar amount. It's really about engagement and connection and um, the whole idea of service as a wonderful project-based learning tool. Next. And the second. Uh, there we go. That, yeah, okay. So the final um, six of the 12 takeaways um, is sort of believing in your kids' resilience, um, starting with, again, like the slide before, tangible gifts and causes. Um, don't worry if you make mistakes. Allow for mistakes. Offer time for revision. And um, that is a really powerful one. Uh, valuing success beyond the material aspects. Again, going back to these universal virtues like empathy, patience, flexibility, and um, sort of reflecting on how those came into play during the service learning, how your perspective might have changed, what you're going to continue to work on once the project is finished. Um, we have found that working together for a cause builds friendships, breaks social barriers. It's a wonderful unifier. And um, finally, this lesson that we see, um, think of the effort like a compound interest earning bank account, that children who start early will realize the greatest long-term gains and benefits of their investment of time, energy, courage, and material resources. So the small steps that they're taking in class as a surface learning activity really, really add up. It's really sort of like a muscle that they're building um, that they'll keep their whole lives. Next. So we're, we're excited about each of these sections. Um, and so from service learning, technology, 
integrating um, curriculum and lesson plans into the global learning as well as school-wide activities and uh, getting more people involved in the activities, organizing it. All of these, we think, sort of come together to make up um, the, not just a toolkit, but come together to make up sort of a global approach to um, whatever you're able to handle at your school. And our timing is good. We have a bit of time for um, any questions or takeaways that anyone may want to share. You can share it either in the chat section or um, if you are on Twitter and you want to use the GET kit, which stands for Global Education Toolkit hashtag, um, we have people from Corwin that are helping us to monitor any tweets that might be coming in. Um, but we love to hear questions. We love to hear um, how any of this might be working or if this was helpful. Because we realize we're also just sort of giving a real broad stroke to a lot of information that's in the book. And we're hoping to um, spur any initiatives, ideas, questions by presenting the material this way. So I don't know, Becky, if you want to add any thing at the end while we're waiting for any questions to come in? Something that I've been hearing some feedback is that um, in our book there's actually a website that we link to and um, you will get all the links that are listed in the book, which really a lot of the resources are online that we offer. And there's videos and there's lesson plans and there's um, teacher's blogs. And the way that it works is that there is a QR code at the beginning of every chapter. Tell me if I'm wrong, Homa. And it goes to a live link that's password protected, and you're able to access all of the links in the book online. So you can just, you know, click away and find the resources that we mentioned. And another resource that we didn't talk about right now, but also has been getting some great praise and feedback, has been the list of multicultural books at the end of the, in the appendix of the book. We have. How many books do we have now, Homa, in there? I think over... It's over 300. I think it's over like 300. 300. Yes, yeah, yeah. broken down by geographic region and also early elementary versus late elementary and then some that are appropriate for all ages. That has been just an awesome tool because sometimes you don't know where to start with a high quality. You want to make sure that you're not perpetuating stereotypes or you're not uh, overgeneralizing. And I think that the books that we picked out are, are really good. We consulted with a lot of different cultural consultants that helped us um, narrow it down to really the best picks of multicultural books for kids. I'm looking right. at a tweet. And there's also, mm -hmm. just, there's also um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually excited about the appendices um, or what we call additional resources in the book because a lot of people may want to just make um, a passport and it might be kind of a messy yes. process. So we um, enlisted our friend Sasha Martin who has a fabulous website, Global Table Adventure, and she created a really neat passport that can be printed out from the website or photocopied from the book and you can just fold it and follow the directions and have a nice little passport for your students. We also have examples of posters and flyers and club activities um, that can just, you know, it's sort of like a pop-up um, global school. Yes, I, I love that passport. We actually just voted that we're going to use it next year for our international week at our school. Oh, good. good. <laughs> yeah. And you were going to share, there's a question that came on Twitter, from Twitter. I was just looking up, someone joined a little late, but how do you connect to other schools worldwide, someone is asking. Um, if if people want to respond in the chat box to the presenter or host and host, we will read aloud your answers because I think I understand that they can't respond to all attendees. So anything you put in the chat, we will read it out loud for people um, for people to understand. Let's see. So are you going to answer okay. that question? Yes. So how do we get connected to other schools worldwide? Um, 
the first way that we did it at our school was Skype in the classroom. I set up an account and we brainstormed with the other teachers that were going to be involved. What is a simple but kind of engaging, fun conversation we can have with schools in different countries? We found that we were limited by the time zone change. Um, we signed up to, you know, Skype with a school in Abu Dhabi, and then we couldn't find a time where we were both able to Skype because we're in school from 8 to 3, and they are also, and there was never any overlap. So that's one thing to consider. Um, but we ended up doing an email exchange with that school, and we did Skype with schools in Canada, um, several places in the United States, and Mexico and Argentina. And we decided that we would talk about recess. So we gave the topic to the kids, and the kids came up with some of the questions. Um, they were wondering how long the recess was, and what did they play at recess, and was it inside or outside, what did you do for bad weather. And it was really fascinating for our kids, because we're in Houston, Texas, and it's always hot here. Um, we just we just assumed that if it was cold, maybe the kids wouldn't go outside. And the kids in three of the schools, two in Canada and one in Maine, were telling us that they always go outside, even if it's below zero, you just dress appropriately. They brought in snowballs. They showed us how to put on their um, snow suits. They have a special closet in the back of their classroom for all the snow gear. And our kids were telling them that we get to check out basketballs and kickballs and jump ropes from the right outside of the recess, they can check them out. And the kids in Canada were telling us that they get to check out ice skates and sleds. And they have actually a sledding hill and an ice skating rink in the playground, which was just, it was so fascinating. Our kids absolutely loved it, and they always want to talk to that school again. Another school in New York City is on the top of a high rise. And so they actually have their recess on the roof with these really tall fences. They were explaining it to us. And our kids couldn't get over it. They were like, but what happens if the ball goes over the fence? And um, they just had some really good laughs. And it was really fun to see the different perspectives and to start thinking about, um, you know, maybe we could go outside if it's 40 degrees out. Maybe that's not too cold <laughs> to go outside and play. So we started with Skype. We also did a really fun postcard exchange this year. Um, and we had postcards, I want to say, from over 50 countries that were sent to us. And that was fascinating because the kids, it was labeled to the grade, and the kids got to find where the postcard came from on the map. We had a big school-wide display of all the postcards, and many people wrote on the back something interesting about their country. So we had Cambodia. My kids, um, I tweeted it out. And if you use the hashtag global ed or comments for kids, those are two great hashtags to get teachers involved. And in a day, I already had 10 different countries signing up that they were going to send us postcards. And um, it was awesome for the kids. One school, several schools went beyond postcards and actually sent a bunch of pictures with a huge letter all about their school. So we're now working on sending letters back to those schools. And that just started from some parents and teachers in the school tweeted it out to their contacts. And we got, I mean, hundreds of postcards. Hundreds. <laughs> I you was know, in charge of hanging also, them up. <laughs> there are also great other great organizations in addition to Skype in the classroom that are providing mm -hmm. great platforms for connecting with other schools, which was um, the question that you're answering. So organizations like I Earn, like um, yes. Connect All Schools, which is connected to that, Taking IT Global, T I G. Um, the Challenge 2020 program, the Flat Classroom Project. There are um, a lot of e pals is another one. e pals So there are so many, and we have literally dozens of these um, that also are in the books. So that's um, that's one way. And there was another question. We are just about done. Um, we're almost out of time. That asks. Where was that question? Um, what was the name you, of the website with the past? Okay, I wrote that. That's included in the chat box so people can find that, Global Table Adventure. And then there was a question from Twitter, how do you incorporate global ed in curriculum, which is I think you have to look at slides like 11 through 36 <laughs> mm -hmm, on this mm -hmm. presentation. But I think, you know, as sort of a big picture, incorporating global ed into curriculum, that's another muscle to me. Start small, bring out a map, try to, re you know, whether it's literature from one country that you haven't thought about or 
showing a movie that you don't normally, you know, get out of your comfort zone in one, take one baby step, do one new thing. Um, and like we mentioned, in science there are a lot of opportunities, but you almost need to just give yourself, I think, a few minutes to kind of brainstorm, explore, collaborate with other colleagues, whether they're in the building or you meet them through Twitter and you start a PLN. Um, but really, it's take a small step and brainstorm. Of course, I would want to say read our book because that's what the bulk of the book is, how to incorporate it into curriculum in the classroom. But um, there are really, you know, so many entrees to bringing the world in. It's really almost just limited by our imagination is kind of my takeaway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think that we are exactly at our hour. And um, thanks to everyone who patiently participated and uh, gave us some great questions. Thanks so much to the team at Corwin who did an amazing job setting this up, and Becky. It's so much fun. By the way, I met Becky on Twitter. <laughs> this was a match made in twi on Twitter. Um, so it really is <laughs> And actually, everyone who's listening, oh. it would be really fun to connect on Twitter because we're always sharing ideas, and we're always looking for more ways that classes are connecting um, with each other around the world. So if you want to, on the last slide, we have our Twitter handles up there. And if you have an idea or if something works for you, share it with us and we'll share it with our um, with our readers as well. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. And also, just quickly, this whole um, presentation has been recorded. So if for some reason you want to go back and reference any of the slides, you can find that on the Corwin website. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone.